everyone. I have Noon here, so I think we can get started. Um, good afternoon, and everyone, welcome to our webinar, Challenges and Opportunities of Managed Transition Cows in Automated Milk Systems. I'm Victor Malaco, um, I, Extension Educator from Michigan State University, and I'll be co-hosting this meeting today with Camila Laje from Cornell Cooperative Extension. Thank you, Pete and um, Todd, for accepting our invitation and joining us for this webinar to share a little bit about uh, your expertise and your knowledge on that. And before we begin, uh, let me provide some instructions for the webinar. We have two. We will have the two consecutive presentations, each lasting about 20 minutes, followed by uh, 20 minutes question and answer section. So, if you have any question for our speakers, please uh, put them in the Q and A box, and we will make sure that we gonna answer them at the end. If you have any problems with your Zoom connection, you can send a, a message in the chat for me or for Camila, and we can try to help you. Um, I'll pass the floor for Camila so she can introduce herself and um, uh, also Margaret from the Northwest team. And the floor is your Camila. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Camila Laje, and I'm a dairy management specialist with the Southwest New York Dairy Livestock and Food Crops Program. Uh, and we are here uh, joined today as well with Margaret Kosdorf, who is a dairy management specialist with the Northwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops Program. And I would like to thank her for the support and collaboration with this program. And I'm going to pass it to her so she can introduce Pete and we can get started with the presentations. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much, Camilla. You can't see my video today, but hopefully you can see my voice. Again, my name is Margaret Quasdorf, Dairy Management Specialist with the North, Northwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops Program here introducing Pete Maslin. Pete Maslin has been the dairy herd manager at Hemdale Farms for over a decade now. And um, Hemdale, Hemdale, Farms, Hemdale Farms is a robotic dairy in Ontario County here in Western New York. So Pete, I'm going to have you just briefly give a little bit more about your background and a little bit more about the farm, and then you can go from there. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um, so yeah, I'm Pete Masline. I've been uh, the dairy manager at Hemdale Farm since 2008. Um, when I came in to the farm, we were about six months into our first four robots. We had uh, four Lely A3s that were put in in October of 2007, mostly milking um, first and second lactation cows. But I've been there ever since for all the transitions. And um, hopefully I have some information to share with you. I, I think I've found more things that we've done wrong than right to share, but we'll see how that, how that goes. Like I said, I started in 2008. Um, we were only four robots at the time, milking the balance of our cows. At the um, time, there were about 220 cows in the robots. 400 cows were milking in an older, pretty antiquated parlor. I think the original parlor was built in 1958 and updated a few times since then. Um, then in October, between May and October of 2009, we went forward with all robots. Um, we went up from four to 13 robots. We shut down our parlor in December of 2009, and um, everything's been milked robotically since then. Um, and we've also incrementally added more robots and cows. Um, our current herd size is 1,600 total cows, 1385 milking um, with 22 robots. There's 14 A3s and eight, and eight A4s in the mix. A um, little bit about the farm in general. We farm 3,000 acres, grow our own corn silage, corn dry grain, and alfalfa. And we also do a, a pretty large, uh, about 400, 450 acres of cabbage. And we've got a large greenhouse operation where we raise about 20 million transplants, uh, 5 million are for our own use for the cabbage crop, and then about 15 million are sold. Um, so just to regain some credibility after the mix up in the beginning, this is some of our herd stats, just so you know kind of a little more about us. Um, currently averaging 93 pounds per cow, 4.04 fat, 3.27 protein. So 99.6 energy corrected milk, um, 130,000 somatic cell count. We've been a little lower than that 
last year we'd gotten down below 100,000 for a few months. Um, this year we're really pushing cow numbers. I haven't been as aggressive at trying to get that down a little more, but there we, we could do better there. Uh, cow rate historically has been right around that 33 to 35% range. Uh, pregnancy rate right now is around 38%. Um, we're averaging 63 cows per robot and uh, 2.6 milkings per cow per day, 2.5 failures per robot per day average, and uh, 5,804 pounds of milk harvested per robot per day. The uh, free time I put in there is 12%. That's for all 22, but if you take out the special needs robots in our fresh pen and hospital group, the average for our milking groups is only 7.2. So you can kind of, if you're familiar with robot terminology, you can kind of see that we're um, kind of pressed for space. And then, like I said, uh, sometimes it's easier for me to see things that we didn't do right than we did do right. Um, this is a picture of our fresh cow pen. There's two pictures going on here, but it's basically the view that the cow would have um, looking to go into that robot commitment area. And, you know, you can kind of see there's a lot of one-way gates and, and things set up there, um, not as inviting as I'd like it to be. And the one-ways, the real purpose of those one-way gates is strictly to force exit traffic through our footpath. Um, but those one-way gates are just one more thing for a new heifer to have to learn. You know, they're already learning how to come into a robot and get milked by themselves, just get milked alone. Um, as you know, whether it's a parlor or a robot, there'll be one thing, but um, then to figure out how to maneuver through these gates is a, is a whole other obstacle. Um, and then some of our fresh cow pen uh, management strategies, we, um, right now we're moving mature cows out of that pen at about seven to 10 days in milk. Um, the heifers, we try to keep them there until 21 days in milk at least. I would like to keep that pen size limited to about 80 cows, so about 40 per robot. Um, with our calving pressure and, and uh, the pressure on the other robots, we're usually getting up to 85 to 90 cows before I move out. And when I, I'm moving out two or three times a week just to get them down to 75 or 80 cows. So we're a little fuller than I'd like them to be. Um, keeping that those numbers down, I think, in the fresh cow pen just allows those cows to have a little more access to the robots without um, the aggressive cows keeping them away. And then fetching, we fetch four times a day in our general milking pens. The um, fresh cow pen, it's more like a six times a day fetch. But um, if you were if you're there all day, it looks more like there's more going on in that. Um, there's a lot that goes on at Fresh Cow Pen, so it seems like there's always somebody, somebody in there. Um, some changes that we made in the recent year or so is um, we come. We used to have a, a pre-fresh heifer group and a pre-fresh dry pen for mature cows. Um, we switched to having that as an all one group system. Um, We've, we felt like getting them to socialize before moving to that fresh cow pen really helped with those heifers to take off. And um, we also, be, just because of our facility, it also eliminated a couple of dead end alleys in those groups, which, you know, you read all the time about different studies talking about things like that. But when you really, when you do actually eliminate some of those dead end alleys and see cow behavior, you realize that it really does have a big impact because we, were, we walk that fresh pen every 45 or 50 minutes to check on cows who are just in time calving. And with the dead end alleys, you're always having cows that are just getting excited because they can't get away from you. So it eliminated that as well, which we weren't really anticipating, but I think that's a, a big factor as well. And then with those changes, we saw a big decrease in the heifer DOAs, um, calf DOAs, metritis, and DAs. Um, I guess my one big question here that we don't know the answer to is would those heifers be better off if they were kept separate 
and then had a separate fresh cow pen just for heifers and a separate fresh cow pen for mature cows. But at this point, we don't have the numbers to justify doing that. So I, I don't have an answer there, but I think it'd be a neat thing to study. Um, this is one of our, our newer barns. This one was, I think, uh, built in 2013 with the A4 robot. So this is a high cow pen, which I put the picture up there. I know we're talking about transition cows, but I, I did it mostly just to show the contrast between this pen with that nice open space in front of the, of the robots versus that fresh cow pen where we relied on those um, one-way gates to kind of force traffic around. Um, with these, we were able to put a foot bath right between the head-to-head -head, um, exits of the robots. And there's actually a, a sort gate here. So when we're not using it, the cow's not walking through that foot bath, making it turn into a cesspool. Um, and then on the days we are using it, we can select cows that go through for two passes on a foot bath day. So, um, you know, just, I guess my reason for showing this is just if you're looking at robots or thinking about doing something, I think all these factors are important. Um, every farm I've been on, it seems like they have a different philosophy on where to put, put foot baths. I still think that's one of the hardest things to figure out with a robot layout is the best place for a foot bath. And, and then, um, like I talked about, we had had, we've, we are pretty full. Um, wait a second. Oh. <clears throat> we uh, are pushing numbers in some of these other pens. Um, some of our high groups are actually getting close to 70 cows per robot on, on some weeks. So this summer we are installing five more A5 robots. Um, this is a picture of one that's still in the installation pro process. So that's a picture of the same group we were just looking at. Um, this robot will be perpendicular to the other two and hopefully alleviate some of that overcrowding on the robots out there, which um, we hope will allow us to you know, move some cows out of the fresh group a little more timely um, and keep those numbers down, but also keep the cows in the fresh group that need to be in there a little bit longer that maybe we rush through a little bit. Um, one of the other things we are considering is um, that one of the robots we'll be adding will be in a heifer pin. Um, and we are thinking about putting in a separation area behind that robot so I can have probably 30 animals in that separation area, which might be a second training pen or graduation pen out of um, out of our pen one or our fresh cow pen. Because um, sometimes if we have one that's just not figuring the system out, she stays in there a little longer than we'd like to. And we feel like the this robot, if it's set up right, might be a little more hands off um, for them to, to learn the system. And then just on a uh, typical cow handling perspective, um, from where we were prior to robots to now, um, we, we rely a lot more on the data than we had. We didn't have all the data we have today. I think in the parlor we had activity, but that was it. Um, and I guess we did have conductivity. But now with our tags, we've got rumination, eating time, activity, um, we have body weight from the A3 robots, fat, protein, spent cell count, and milk conductivity. And um, lately it's gotten a lot better too in the past 15 years I've been working with them that um, initially it was, I felt like it was sort of on us to figure out what cows to really target um, based on what we were seeing from any one of these factors. Um, but they've uh, done a lot with analytics and um, have a pretty nice health indication report now. Um, that's sort of what my three circles represent is, you know, if there's one or two things that are off with a cow, it could be a blip or it, it could be the, it could possibly be the start of something. But for me, the cows I really want to target and spend time on are where those 
those three circles overlap and where you know we've got a, a count of the rumination or eating times down and you know and and, and then a somatic cell count or milk conductivity you know there's something going on um and so they have a nice system to rank those cows and and uh, we really know which ones to target we're not wasting time locking up cows that don't need to be um the old system would have been more of uh, we were temping cows every day, checking for ketosis on every cow less than 10 days in milk. Um, so cows are stuck in headlocks a lot more than they are today. And then um, we do a pretty aggressive CMT screening on fresh cows also. Um, prior to the semi cell cow information, we were we would CMT every cow that freshened in the past, you know, once a week, we would make a list of everybody that calved in the past seven days and CMT every cow. With this minute cell count information, we're just really targeting the cows that are more likely to have a, an issue. Um, so that too just cuts down on those cow touches. Um, so I'm hoping I answered some questions. Uh, I'm probably anticipating more questions to know exactly where you want the discussion to go to, but I'll end with this slide. And um, this is sort of our model at Hemdale Farms, uh, the cow tails model. model. And um, I, for me, I think anybody looking at robots, the, the A in there except change is probably the, the most important one because um, over the 15 years I've been here, it, we've never had a, one day that's the same as the, the day before. So um, we're still learning. And uh, like I said, I don't have all the answers because we don't know everything, <laughs> but um, so, so that's my presentation. I think Todd will probably fill in all the facts for you and, and figures and stuff. So thank you. Thank you so much, Pete, for the great presentation, for sharing so much about the uh, Hemdale Farm and your management there. It's interesting how you deal with all the information that you can get with the robots. And that I think is a great part of the management to be successful. Um, so as a reminder, if you have any questions for Pete, you can drop uh, your questions in the Q&A box and we're going to make sure that we will answer all the questions at the end. And so moving to the second presentation, uh, which focuses on the challenges and opportunities of managing transition cows in automatic milk systems. Um, welcome Todd, uh, Ward and Todd, kindly introduce yourself and you can begin your presentation then. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'm a uh, independent uh, nutrition and robot consultant. It covers uh, a lot of territory across the country. I've mm -hmm. uh, been working specifically robotically probably about 10 straight years now. I've really immersed myself into the uh, the robot side of it and work with all types of uh, robots. Uh, and plus maintaining a uh, nutrition business with uh, my conventional dairies too. So, uh, but I cover... Uh, all of the United States, uh, with most of my uh, clients being here in the East. So, but anyways, uh, so we I got quite a bit to cover. So hopefully, I can get it all done in the uh, the time frame. So we'll move right along here. So for today's discussion, uh, there are different types of robotic facilities, and this is a robotic type, and then a batch type um, robotic uh, system on the right side. And and these two systems are not going to be talked about today for as far as the way that uh, the training system and everything else, what I am gonna be talking about is the individually um, box automated milking systems or what I call IBAMs. And there's there's several different versions and several different colors out there, but they all kind of run under the same, under the same category for when we start talking about uh, um, how we're going to perceive and work with cow behavior um, in these facilities and as we transition cows into these um, into these facilities and what I see going across the country. So do have to cover a couple definitions. There are two types of IBAMs that I call and in, in uh, the industry's calling and that's the free flow where there's fully automated like you saw at, at uh, Hemdale, even though there's some partially guided stuff in their prefresh group or in their fresh group, I mean, um, but the uh, uh, basically, they're a free flow facility, and then um, there's other facilities that are run guided, which are also classified or subclassified as milk first, modified, or or feed first. There are many different types of um, programs that I run across as far as uh, feeding and introducing the uh, fresh cow to the the systems and the full robot system is like what what uh, Hemdale has there, where there's no parlor attached to it. 
and they have to do things differently than we have the luxury of places when we have a parlor attached to the facility where we get to have the best of both worlds. So in, in Pete's situation, you know, all cows have to freshen in and go through, be milked through a robot. We don't have the luxury of having a, a, a parlor there to milk those cows and uh, which affects our free time and our, or our idle time, um, depending on how we're being recorded. The, uh, it'll affect on how that cow, uh, how much time we have to milk cows in, in those facilities. Where we have a robot and a conventional parlor together, we have different ways, and this, these are just a few. There's, there's many different ways that things are being done on these facilities, but where we're you know, milking a cow one to three days on the parlor to get her to get her clean from any uh, dry treatment or, or to make sure that she's healthy enough to go into general population of a robot facility. Um, and when we do things like that, it helps us to, uh, to uh, save some free time or some idle time uh, to give for milking cows because we don't have to spend extra time with the machine washing. So one of the downfalls of these types of machines is every time we, we milk a fresh cow or, or uh, a new cow into the facility, it has to wash afterwards. So we try to group those cows together or have them milk in a parlor. There's recently been a trend for a lot of dairies, uh, especially larger dairies uh, in the robotic world to milk their fresh cows in their parlor for one to 21 days or even a little bit longer. And this has to do with some transition issues that are taking place on those facilities. And it seems to uh, to get away from that. And I, I uh, been working real hard and diligently to try to uh, come up with uh, programs to work with these types of facilities so that we don't have to do that. We can put those cows right onto the robot uh, as soon as they're clean and clear and ready to go. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a formula for success for bringing our transition cows into our um, IBAMs, and this is uh, you know basically health plus training plus comfort plus the energy balance of the ration, either being from the PMR or for them pellets or any grain or grist mist that's being fed through the robot, uh, that all translates into a well-managed well transition cow in IBAMs. So uh, all those things playing together and, and you have to work uh, to make sure that all those are working together and, and being able to identify when those problems arise. And so as we, uh, as we start to look into this and identify these things, if we're currently having DAs, retained placentas, milk fevers, ketosis, and lameness in those facilities, you know, these, these things have to be fixed prior to the cow entering, entering the facility, or it just really slows the facility down. And if we have situations where we have lots of these incidences taking place, then we have to take a look at those rations or those facilities that are causing those problems prior to those cows entering to the, the milking stream. No different than we would do in a parlor system. However, it really gets magnified in these, um, in these, um, individually boxed uh, systems when we're trying to get autonomy out of the cow if she's not feeling well she's unlikely to do what we want her to do or train her to do. A lot of the um, nutrition work around it and the nutrition gets a lot of focus in these dairies but uh, you know there's there's lots of different uh, pre-fresh and uh, close-up diets that take place in these facilities and I'm not advocating any specific product here just uh, throwing out some names that people may recognize as and when they're doing a low DCAD diet as far as they're using soy chlor, animator, bovichlora to bring down that DCAD in the diet. And there's also some uh, quite a bit of work um, with, and I do use some of this uh, excellent um, in some of my dairies to control um, the dry cow program a little bit. And there's other dairies that are using proglycol. Um, I'm not a component of that. I think there's some other ways to do that, but there is some ways to feed this into the robot. And there are some people that are that are doing it well under dairies. Um, I just question whether we need to feed propylene glycol if we could do something different prior to those cows coming in. And then there's all other types of different types of uh, dry cow diets that are being performed on these dairies from anything from a, a well-balanced diet to nothing at all. So I put that category in here as other. So. I think the most important thing, and, and I'll give credit to the first person I ever heard uh, talk robotically, and that was uh, Jack Rodenberg. And uh, he, he specifically said the most important thing in robotic facilities is pellet quality. And I, I agree with him, it's 100% correct. If the pellet is not tasty, well put together, and smells great, and I mean smells great to the cow, not to the person or the people, but to the cow, then that's the that's the real game changer and whether that cow is going to come to that robot on top of some of the other factors that I'll show. But the real key here is to make sure that we got a pellet. And, and if we start looking at this, you know, this is a decent pellet, but it's got some fines in it. But what we recognize in the bowl here is that the, you know, the cows are leaving that. And um, 
lots of times when we're training heifers and we're training cows um when we're bringing them in we get this uh this leftover feed because she's very nervous because of the situation that uh uh, uh, you know, it's it's all new to her. She's got this new machine. She's got this new box that she's in. She's got all these new noises. The last thing's on her mind is eating. But after we've got cows transitioned in these facilities, these bulls ought to be cleaned right up. And if we have a really bad pellet, like what we see here, you know, it builds right up and we don't get the nutrient density into the cows and the cows are less likely to come to the robot because it's not a very favorable situation for those cows. What we really want to see in, in this, you can see a resonance of molasses, and I'm not advocating molasses, just saying that, uh, you know, this is what a bull should look like when it's, when after a cow leaves each time, except for when we have cows that are training, I, I understand that, but 99% uh, of the cows going through there, this bull should be licked right clean, and if we're not seeing this type of activity, then we have to change the feed that's being fed to it, and again, this is the top priority. If this is not being fixed, um, then you're, you're going to struggle with with cows coming to the robot, troubling with, with uh, with training your cows, troubling with getting your cows to milk properly. So, so we take a look at that. Uh, some of the other things that um, that will affect that pellet equality that may come out of the feed mill really nice. And then uh, we have some other things in our feed delivery systems. And here's an example of a piece of plastic that just happened recently on a dairy of mine. Uh, the piece of plastic came from the feed mill. It's from a tote, we believe, and it got stuck in the flex auger and it stayed in the flex auger. So the pellets looked really good at the feed mill, but by the time they got to the cow's side, they were really beat up in tough shape. And we saw more like what we saw with that with that uh, mealy pellet that uh, um, thing. And, and when that happens, turns goes down, cow's, cow milk production goes down, not only because of turns, but because we're not getting the nutrient density into those cows either. So uh, things to be thinking about, especially with these flex auger systems to be looking at at the feed coming out of the feed bin and then the feed going uh, what's actually in front of the cow. And if those are two different things, we have to expect in, inspect that feed system to make sure that the feed's not being beat up and pulverized and turned into a mush that's something that, or a mash that the cows don't want to eat. So common failures that we have in the transition in IBAMs is, uh, you know, to, and, and Pete hit on it a little bit there, you, you, get, you get too many cows per box and it really affects what's going on because the, the right cows can't be milked at the right time and it's just a huge traffic jam. No different than for us folks that drive down throughways, especially around cities. Um, when we get a lot of people on the road, it backs right up and everything slows right down. Well, the same thing happens in our in our farm here with that, that traffic flows right down and the right cows don't get to the to the robot at the right time. Uh, other things that have affected are non-effective training programs. And we'll talk a little bit about a training program that I use. And then uh, grouping animals um, when we're, when we're uh, working with them. So grouping as far as uh, separating them off in separation pens. And I, and I, I say this over grouping these animals. We group animals to do uh, herd health. We group animals to do uh, hoof, hoof uh, thing. We do it for shots. We do it for dry off. We do it for all kinds of things. The more grouping we do of animals, the more the cow expects to be grouped and the less autonomy that we, we achieve in those facilities in a free flow situation and in effects in our in our uh, guided situations too. The more we group the animals, the less traffic we get because they're expecting us to come through and group them together. Uh, just some social behavior that I've learned over the last 10 years that we're trying to uh, trying to get away from. And, uh, you know, the, the larger the dairy, the harder this is because we have so many cows that we have to manage with with a few labor force. So, uh, and then comfort in the robots. I'll touch a little bit about on that. I've got some slides showing some things or some videos showing some things about some comfort issues that we run across, especially this time of year in, in, the, in the robots. And I put nutrition here last. Uh, because nutrition gets a lot of uh, uh, focus here in, in this field, and, and I am a nutritionist. However, I'm not trying to back out of this, but sometimes nutrition is the last thing that's uh, causing the problem. We've got a lot of other things ahead of it. Doesn't mean that nutrition doesn't cause the problem, just means sometimes that's not should not be the main focus and that we should be looking at some of these other things and then fixing nutrition as we go along because that nutrition is going to change as we get, uh, as we get to cow pattern or cow flow. Uh, through the barn, that nutrition is going to change either what we put in the PMR and what we feed at the robot side versus what we uh, versus taking out of the PMR and feeding in the robot uh, with less traffic. So, so I, I developed a program uh, that analyzes the data, and it does this on all of the uh, all the different robot models. I dumped this in so I could standardize the information and take a look at it. And there's a lot of information on this page, and some of some of the people that are joining us today have seen this before, 
but it breaks it down and I, I'm just going to shrink it down or, or cut out a piece of it here, which I want to talk about today and we'll blow this up. But typically what we see here is in this yellow area, this is the days of milk that I've got the cows stratified by. And then this is the milkings that they have um, in the blue here where it says under milkings for 2.4. So cows one to 10 days here are being milked 2.4 times a day. And then cows from 10 to 60 are being milked 3.14, 3.1, 3 3.5 and so forth and on. But this is typically what I see as I, as I cross the country and in the early lactation, we're milking cows very little up front. And if you look at the white column over here where we see the, the pound sign, you got a four, a three and a half, a three, a three and two and a half. That's kind of my goals that I've set for um, my clients when I work with them that I'd like to see. And in between the milkings and that number is the percent of the animals that should fall in that category. So this is an actual working farm that, that have been troubleshooting. You know, they were making decent milk on this farm, but wanted to do better. And they were fetching way too many cows. They were spending four to five times in the pens a day uh, fetching cows. And, and we wanted to knock that down to something that was more effective uh, labor-wise for the dairy. And what we recognize is when we start milking cows more up front, so that one to 10 day time, they turn into... Um, you know, 3.5 uh, from that 10 to 60 day mark and then 60 to 110, they're more likely to maintain those three times a day milking and so forth and, and down through as you can see the pattern here on the sheet. So um, lots of people always, when I show this to them, they say, yep, well, we, we know we were milking the cows two times a day. We didn't realize we, were, we weren't getting them as much as we should. So, you know, biology of the cow says the more times I milk her up front in that first 21 days is the more opportunity I got to make more milk on her and get her peak higher. So I'm trying to uh, to drive her above PMR energy, which we'll talk about when we get to the training program. But um, if we look at another dairy, so this is another dairy in similar milk production. This one's uh, about twice the size of the last dairy that we looked at. So four robots versus eight robots in this eight robot dairy. And if we look at the same set of sections on, and this is a dairy that's on that same training program, we've got those one to 10 day cows and they are at 4.6 uh, uh, times a day milking on there. And 71% of those cows are hitting that four times a day. And so that means we have a few cows that have, you know, that aren't getting there for some reason. Uh, it could be, a, you know, a lameness issue, a sickness issue or something like that that's causing the, the cow to not, to, to not join our average of greater than uh, four times a day. But we've got 71% of those animals hitting that, which is, this is pretty good. And then you can see as they follow down through, we get that three and a half, three, just under three. And we're managing that group at the two, uh, 110 to 220 down to uh, 2.85 days to try to hold some milk in the udder and those later lactation cows for some time because we're out of free time on this herd and we're trying to gain gain that back. So that's one of the reasons we've cut, cut our milkings on these later lactation cows is to gain some free time. But never would want to cut my uh, milkings on my early lactation cows. And that's my one to 100 day cows. I would not want to cut my milkings on that. So... Uh, just to show you that the program can be done and it works well when we start looking into achieving this. When we're doing this, about the only thing that we're really in the pen affecting and, and the dairymen will tell you that are using these this type of program is, is the only thing that they're really collecting is, is uh, training cows. Uh, very rarely do we have a high fetch list and very rarely do, uh, do uh, unless we have a feed change. If we have a feed change or some breakdown or some problem, then we end up having some cows that are late or on our red list. And if, if, they, if that shows up, then we have to get back in there and get those cows back on to keep, the ener keep their energy above the PMR. So um, this, this program works, it works well. It's not for everybody, but it, it does work well. And we're down to two times a day milking on it. And I'll share that program with you in the end here when we get through. So a couple other things to talk about is, is the comfort in the robot. So you know each time that we bring that new cow to the robot, we wanna make sure she has that spa experience. She's got a great time when she comes in. We don't want any disruption. Hopefully after about the second or third milking um, on that new cow that she's starting to eat feed, she's starting to relax in the robot. We're starting to see better milk speeds because she's not all tight. She's letting her milk down, all those, all those things saying she up, she's really starting to like this deal. Um, and uh, some of it starts just like in the parlor, right back at the animal husbandry side of it for when we're bringing cows in. And I'll show a video here that, uh, that as we're seeing, you know, I got one cow walking in front of me, but as you can see, the other cows way up in front of there, they're starting to gather up. And, and you'll see as we get closer to the end of the video here, we're getting more cows and even cows standing up that are starting to group up and go together. So it's, this is a classic sign of when the dairymen themselves are, um, are, uh, uh, collecting a lot of cows at one time during fetch time and putting them into a pen. So we, they get that behavior because uh, they, they think that's what has to happen. We want, they're going to push all those cows together. 
So if we could go back to that video for in the beginning, you know, the, the behavior we really want is this one cow walking through the rest of the herd and not being bothered by the rest of them. So this is a, a human training behavior that we can teach to not have happen. And so that we get this one cow going through as we as we want her to and not the whole groups of cows going up or going up to the facility. So um, other things that really, really affect how well the cow uh, transitions into the facility is how lame she is, right? Lame cows just don't come to the robot. They don't want to, they don't feel well. So we have to make sure that we fix the strawberries or the or the uh, hairy warts or any lameness issues that we have to those animals before bringing them in. So again, a common pitfall that we have in, in, uh, in bringing transition cows in. Another thing to, to not overlook in these facilities is stray voltage. And, and we've had some instances, uh, most of the dealers do a great job of hooking things up and making sure things are well, um, well grounded and, and a lot of the, the uh, contractors are doing the same. But it still doesn't mean that we don't occasionally run into some stray voltage. And here was a dairy. This is a robot dairy that we actually ran into some stray voltage. And we had a half a volt going to the cows at the feed wall. And, uh, you know, so at that point in time, it's time to pull in, pull in some experts that can uh, to help us diagnose the, uh, the stray voltage. But definitely if, if she's getting her nose tingled when she's eating or she's getting a nose tingle when she's, when she's, uh, when she's being milked, we have to make sure that, that doesn't ha that's not happening. We got a lot of moving parts in these, on these, these systems as we get more and more automated and get more and more electricity working things. We have to make sure that we're not getting uh, stray voltage to the animals. So I throw that in there because I, I've seen that in, in uh, quite a few places and we forget to look at those things. So the other thing is improper milkings. Um, uh, so I do a lot of testing on all the robots and to make sure that they're milking properly as far as over milking, improper vacuums, and even inflation choices on these. On these, uh, you know, It's not a cookie cutter, one fits all. And it, and it wasn't in your parlor and it, it won't be in these systems either. So we have to be looking at those and, and have qualified people that are able to diagnose and, and set those things up. So I take that back. Uh, um, I take a look at uh, uh, stable flies, this, and this is a timely thing. This is something that's also happened in um, in the facilities. But you can see, you know, she's not comfortable. She's kicking and kicking, and all the little black dots on the end of here are stable flies. Again, this is just something that's it's not a good spot for us before, and it'll really cut down on the amount of time that the cow's in there. So we have to make sure that uh, you know stable flies aren't causing an issue in these robots too. So. Uh, it's very important as you as you work through this to work with your dealers and work with advisors that understand the software. Uh, all the software for all the different robots are different and they feed differently. So you have to really understand the feed charts and, and work with people that know how to set them up or the cows aren't going to get the feed that you expect them to get. And those things will happen. So, you know, work with an advisor or work with a team that really understands that stuff and take a look at it. And I, we could get into uh, several minutes here of just looking at different feed charts and different problems, but I chose not to throw that stuff up to. Um, but uh, definitely you have to work with somebody that understands the software. So let's get into the into the programming, um, into the cow training program that I've kind of developed a little bit in what I'm using with a lot of my clients. And I want you to think about it as we talk about it as this, this uh, throughway or this, this highway with heavy, heavy traffic on it. And that's, that's, your, that's all your cows right there. And all those cars are representing a cow and they're all moving from one way or the other, doing their thing. They're, they're, they're in auto mode here and they're, they're going in whatever, you know, whether they're going to the feed bunk, they're going to lay down, they're going to the robot, or they're going to fool around uh, identifying that one of their partners are in heat. Uh, but uh, either way, you know, the, the cows are uh, uh, moving as these cars do, and we want to merge in some new fresh cows or some new animals into, the, into this, uh, into this uh, car, car stream that we have going on here. And so if we've got this really backed up, backed up uh, line of cars, like as, as Pete was saying, you know, out of free time or out of idle time, we've got a lot of cows going through the box, and we're trying to bring in this one little car or this new fresh cow into the system. If we drive her right into there, we're going to cause an accident. And either either way, if we slide her into the next open spot, she's going to slow the traffic down behind the rest of those the rest of those cows coming in here. So this is a good analogy to think about when you're bringing cows into the facility, how you're affecting the traffic that's being take place with all the rest of the cows in there. We get our little sheet that tells us. You know, we've got this fetch cow and this fetch cow and this fetch cow and this cow, and we got to bring them, bring them to the to the robots. And we, we as humans, we we go out and we collect our cows, and then we bring them up to the robots. And and uh, we're all happy because we made that we made our list clear. But what we've done socially to that herd really could can really disturb and slow up the traffic. 
and, and it can really slow down the number of cows that you're milking in the facility. And it can slow down your training process in these uh, in the fresh cows in the, as we bring them in here, affecting fully affecting the management of those cows. And I use the example on uh, this one here, especially if there's some Canadian folks on here and, and even some American folks that are used to Tim Hortons or any of the other coffee shops. If I'm driving down the road and I see all these cars backed right up to the coffee shop and I'm looking for a coffee, I'm more likely to go to the next coffee shop than I am to sit in that line for 25 minutes just to get my cup of coffee. And uh, so uh, the, the cow does a similar thing in here. If she goes up and there's there's five cows, and especially one of those is a boss cow standing in front of the robot, but she, she really wants to go in the robot to be milked, she will go someplace else than stand around there or take a chance of getting beat up by the boss cow if she's there. So you have to be thinking about that behavior as those are happening. And especially as we have uh, retrofit systems like this where we're bringing cows in and we have uh, several cows in there. If I'm a young timid heifer and I'm going over and headed up to that group of cows, I, I may decide to go someplace else instead of going into the, into the, into the box itself and get milked. And, um, Here's a situation where we, we bring a lot of cows up. So we got that fetch cow list and we bring them all up and then we pen them in. Uh, we pen them in in front of the robot and uh, we pen a lot of cows together. And I've used this example before in several talks, but here's, here's, here's right after a herd was fetching cows uh, from their fetch list. And, and the employees did exactly what they were told to do to go get all these cows and, and put them in that pen. Well, if you start doing the math on that, average box time here is seven minutes. There's nine cows in that pen. That's 63 minutes. We would really be beating you up if this was the uh, if this was a conventional world in a holding area uh, that you've created there. We wouldn't want our cows in, in a holding area for 63 minutes either. So uh, you know we have to recognize what we're doing here when we're bringing in here. It's okay to have these these fetch pens or these collection pens or these commitment pens. Just let's not be overcrowding them. You know one two. Uh, no more than no more than two, I like to say, but some people push it to three cows in that group. But even three cows in that group is still 21 minutes if we got a seven minute box time. And the seven minute box time is pretty well average across all the robots um, in, in the facility. So that's why I use that number. So training is the key. And um, when you bring a fresh cow into the facility, this is the kind of the program I'm I'm suggesting most people move to or try to get to to, to reduce the number of times and the number of hours that you're in the pen. But uh, we have a two time a day training. So morning, afternoon, doesn't really matter um, uh, what time of the day you do it, just as if you, uh, you know, have a few hours in between those or, or you know, if we have our, our typical eight to 10 hours in between those fetching times. But uh, step number one would be your fresh cows. You bring your fresh cows in, any cow that's one to 10 days or one to 10 days in that facility, meaning that if we're milking them someplace else and then bring them in, they're new to the facility. So this becomes training and we have less than four times a day milking on them, then those cows would be uh, brought to the robot individually, um, hopefully using all the robots in the pens to get the cows uh, th through and, and get those cows milked um, and then work on your failed and incomplete cows. And the reason we do that is a failed cow or an incomplete cow is a cow that did not completely get milked. And so we've got to get her back to the robot, find out why she failed or why she was incomplete. If we can fix it, we need to fix it. If we can't fix it on those animals, then we need to make a decision whether that animal stays in the facility or not because she becomes a time waster. And so as we're introducing these fresh cows, if, if we've got cows that are failing um, as a fresh cow, then we want to either be able to fix that. If we can't fix it, then again, she has to decide whether we're going to go someplace else with her, which can be a really hard decision. Or um, if we have other cows in there that are later in lactation that are failing and clean, they're definitely going to affect the time that we have for the training of that fresh cow because the more you, you mess around with those failed cows. So a typical box time would be seven minutes for a lot of these cows. But if we have failed cows in there uh, or incomplete cows, sometimes those cows could take 10 or 15 or 20 minutes to get a full milking out of them by the time we figure it out and get the machine to attach to them. So, uh, you know, failed cows really cost us a lot of time. Then we come back and we do uh, we do our late or um, fetch, collect, late red cows. They're all labeled, the, you know, this this all means the same thing. They just have different names, different buzzwords out there in the uh, in the robot community. So uh, you would you would take care of any of the late cows. Hopefully that list is not very big. And then the last thing you do, and typically this would be an hour, hour and a half later, is run those fresh cows back through again. Well, I'm sure I heard a lot of gas uh, in the audience here uh, when I said that. Uh, but, uh, 
yes, I can milk a cow um, an hour and a half later and, and, and have better udder situation or better udder health than if I didn't milk her um, as many times. And uh, what we're really looking at doing here is stimulating that cow, driving the prolactin levels, increasing our mammary cell, and also trying to get her above the PMR energy as fast as possible. Because if she comes in as a dry cow and she comes into that as a fresh cow, I mean, she's low in dry matter intake. And uh, typically our, our PMR that she's going to go on is a, of a higher energy load, uh, more than the milk production that she's making. So the faster we get her above that milk production or ab above that energy requirement in the PMR, the more likely she is to go to the robot more often. Because remember, she's only gonna go to the robot because she's doing that for an energy needs. So that is, there's, there's more to this than just that, but this is something you wanna to try to strive to get to. So if we're, if we're milking those cows twice each end of the day, then we're getting those four milkings. And I'm not so, not so concerned about the amount of milk I get on the second milking or the amount of feed that they get because the way the feeding systems work, they don't get much feed. I'm more interested in the stimulation and treating that cow and showing that cow that she can go into that box and it's not going to do uh, harm to her. And she's going to have a great experience and want to come back. So uh, just some take home messages here is, is don't overuse our sort pens. Don't overuse them for breeding. Don't ever use them for shops and vets and lame, uh, failed, incompletes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. And as I, as I get involved in some of the barn designs, um, e even on these larger dairies, I'm, I'm advocating not to have too much, too much sorting pen uh, capability because we will overuse them. And on the smaller dairies, we don't need a sorting pen at all. They're small enough to handle. We can do everything right in the pen. And it's just a function of training the people. And I'll say it, uh, I'll say it here because I say it a lot, is uh, cows train really easy to do things. It's the people that train really, really hard as I cross the country. So um, more of the take home here is, is remember, it is about time. You only have 24 hours in a day to feed, uh, to feed and milk this cow and get her in and out. Uh, and we try to get three milkings a day out of her like we would in a parlor. And she has to do that on her own. So she has to have enough time to be able to do it and, and be, have that traffic to go through. And uh, so pellet quality is the key, tasty feed. If, the, if they don't like the feed, then you have to change it. And then look for SOPs that make groups, right? So if we're grouping cows up to do a lot of things in these facilities, we're just creating opportunities for those cows to wait for people to come group them to go through the milking parlor. Kind of like what you'll see uh, this batching milk uh, concept uh, that I showed in the beginning is uh, starting to take some interest and, uh, you know, where we're, we're, we're pushing cows in in large groups and then running them through a lot of robots. Uh, um, so that same concept uh, would work well if you're going to group it, but in these individually boxed uh, grouping cows just slows down our traffic and causes more fetch cows. Uh, training is the good key for, is a, is a key to good traffic. Uh, along with health and nutrition and everything else, but training is is uh, is uh, can definitely make a huge difference. And uh, get out and look in the cows and see what they're telling us. Right? Are they leaking milk in your stalls? If you've got a lot of cows leaking the milk in the stalls, you're probably uh, energy. Uh, you're giving them too much energy either at the robot or at the PMR or both. And um, or those cows are lame, and that's one of the reasons why they'll stay right in the stall and leak. But uh, a lot of times we see it's just a it's just a high energy load. So dancing in the robot from flies or other, other things, stray voltage or uncomfortable milking processes um, can cause that. If you guys are fetching way too many cows, there's an opportunity to do some things differently and reduce the amount of cows that we're fetching because sometimes we train cows to wait for us too. So, and when you're walking through the cows, do many of the cows get up and start doing that? If you're doing that, you're probably seeing a lot of the cows or you're probably doing a lot of grouping to the cows. So there's a lot more that we could talk about this and several, several, uh, several hours we could talk about uh, all the things that uh, that would go in in um, add more depth to what I what I touched on here but uh, we're limited to time so we're gonna we're gonna kick it back to the host here <laughs>